Mirandi was Miranda. Because that's Fred's grandmother's name, and that's the picture. I say my grandparents, but they're really his. And they're the picture of the cakewalk. And so I was using Miranda. It was early morning when Miranda came out looking for Grandmama Beasley. Miranda, I just slammed into a wall. It was like a crash. I said, oh, no, that doesn't work. That hurts my tongue. I said, Miranda, no. And so I was reading it, trying to figure out what to do with the name. And I realized she changed it. I was just reading it one day, and I said, it was early morning when Miranda came out. And I said, that's it. Thank you. She renamed herself Miranda. Instead of Miranda, it's Mirandy. And it works perfectly. At least for me, the writer, it did. I don't. But if you don't know it was Miranda, it wouldn't bother you. But I often change the names of my characters. Once I've written them, because the process for me is to have all of that fixed, really, before I actually start writing. But not all the time does it work that way. But uh, I have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I usually tape what I've written and then revise and tape. And when I'm writing nonfiction, I just leave the gaping hole. And Fred will read it and say, now, Pat. It was sometime during 1859. It's sometime during 1859. And it just gets on his nerves. It grates like chalk on a blackboard. Sometime in 1859. Are you kidding me, Pat? I go, no, you, you'll find something to put in there, I'm sure. <laughs> and I can write. It was in May on a Tuesday, and it was storming, because that man will go and look at the weather report. <laughs> but that's what makes our nonfiction not boring. Okay. It's because there's story there. There's more than just a detail. I give you the visual, as much of it as I can show. Okay. As a wordsmith, and that's what a writer is, it's, it, you, you, it's a craft and it's an art. And you put the two together to get your product, or your story, or your book, or whatever you write. Thank you. Someone else? Please. Got this gimpy knee. It's similar to the one you just answered, but um, I was wondering, you know, how much your, your your characters might tell you what they want to be called once you've decided on something. How much do they often change the direction of the story, or have you you thought of one way that something might go? But your characters themselves have decided, no, we're going to go this way. They certainly do. <laughs> and uh, I tell you what else they do as well. They, they don't like the way I end things sometimes. <laughs> they go back and end it. For an example, in Flossie and the Fox, in the first version, she says, and he says, I'm a fox because I have sharp teeth and I can run exceedingly fast. And then she said, Flossie says, it doesn't matter what I think anymore. And Fox says, why? Why do you say this? It doesn't matter anymore. She said, because one of Mr. J.W. McCutcheon's dogs is behind you. And by the way, he's looking, it's all over for you. <laughs> <laughs> but Fox dashes toward the woods. Now, that's where it ended. That's where it ended, right there. And when I played it on tape, I listened to it and I said, mm -mm. the purpose was not for Flossie to completely wipe the fox out. It was just to, just to uh, uh, divert his attention away from the eggs long enough for her to get through the woods. 
and it worked for her and she was through the woods and she was safe and she was okay. So she didn't need to uh, destroy him. And Fox was just completely undone. So at the end, she calls over his shoulder. The fox calls over his shoulder. Not to worry. The hound dog knows who I am because I've been out running and outsmarting that old miserable mutt for years. Like I told you, I am the fox. And Flossie said, oh, I know. <laughs> I know as she turned toward Miss Viola's with the basket of eggs safely tucked over her arm. And so I've given Fox back his foxhood, and Flossie has made it through the woods safely with her basket of eggs. And so we all come out all right, and I like that much better. Stories are like that for me. And sometimes I overwrite. Um, in a cakewalk, I um, they call my grandfather cake because he loved warm cake and his mom would turn out the cake after she made it. And the story goes is that he would slice it before it cooled and she could ice it. She was forever icing cakes that had the cut out. <laughs> and because my, my grandfather liked to eat warm cake, so they, a lot of his friends called him cake, especially those who knew him in his younger days. And uh, so I went to talk of, on of talking about how he loved to dance and he played, um, uh, as he called it, a fiddle or a violin. And my grandmother used to dance around. She was a petite little thing until we knew her. Of course, she had gained quite a little weight by the time we, we knew her, but she was a little person in her younger day. And she loved to dance and she was light of foot. And so I got a visual of them, and uh, they became very much a part of, of, uh, of that story. So anyway, I, I had them described after the story ended. I went on to tell about my grandparents, and it took away from the story. I do that in the introductions of my story sometimes to give you a setting and where the story came from, but I didn't need it in Miranda, Brother Will, so I took it out. Other times, they said, you know, you need an introduction. And, uh, and so I'll write an introduction, but a lot of times I think, let the story speak for itself.